Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats, council members. Please take your seats. Quiet on the floor, please. Quiet on the floor, please. Please, please take all conversations outside. Council members, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please place all electronic devices, all electronic devices to vibrate. Mr. Majority Leader. Good afternoon and welcome to the welcome to today's meeting. Allow me Welcome to the stated meeting of February 2nd, 2023. I am, hello everybody. I am Majority Leader Keith Powers. I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you'd like to follow along, the agenda for today's meeting is posted on our website. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. Abreu. Present. Ariola. Present. Aviles. Ayala. Here. Barron. Here. Botcher. Here. Brannon. Here. Brewer. Here. Brooks Powers. Here. Caban. Present. Carr. Present. De La Rosa. Here. Dinowitz. Here. Farias. Present. Felice. Here. Gennaro. Here. Gutierrez. Hanif. Here. Hanks. Present. Holden. Here. Hudson. Present. Joseph. Kagan. Here. Krishnan. Here. Lee. Here. Lewis. Here. Marte. Here. Mealy. Menon. Here. Moya. Here. Narcisse. Here. Nurse. Jose. Present. Paladino. Present. Wrestler. Present. Richardson Jordan. Riley. Present. Rivera. Present. Salamanca. Present. Sanchez. Present. Shulman. Here. Stevens. Here. Here. Ung. Present. Velasquez. Present. Vernikoff. Here. Williams. Present. Juan. Here. Jaeger. Here. Nurse. Joseph, thank you. Borelli. I'm here. Powers. Here. Speaker Adams. Present. Thank you. We'll now have today's invocation delivered by Reverend Anthony Trufant, Senior Pastor at Emanuel Baptist Church, located at 279 Lafayette Avenue in Brooklyn. Let us pray. Thank you for welcoming us into this sacred space. We thank you for the privilege of not only being here in this historic chamber, but we thank you for the privilege of still being on the planet. We're grateful to receive from your gracious and merciful hand the gift of time, which we pray you will continue to teach us how to use wisely and well. 
By the end of this day, help us to offer back to you a day's worth of living, loving, and laughter. We ask that your grace, mercy, and guidance fall afresh upon these public servants, especially the city council speaker, the members of the city council, the support staff, inclusive of the custodians. Even as the Big Apple has blessed them, may their collective work be a blessing to all five boroughs, to every community that makes up each borough, every block in each community, and every home on each block. May these public servants who have responded to your call to serve your people never forget who voted for them, whose voice ultimately they must heed, and why you've called them to be a force for the common good. We ask that you tutor them in how to leverage their position in power to improve the standing of all New Yorkers, irrespective of their race, ethnicity, religion, political affiliation, economic status, and sexual orientation. May they resist the temptation to hand out even more opportunities to those on Wall Street, Main Street, skyboxes and arenas, and corporate suites. Instead, may they, like the lady in the harbor, offer more hope and help to the tired, the hungry, the huddled masses, to those who are yearning to be free. Give us heads and hearts that we see the most vulnerable among us, who live not in the Upper East Side, West Side, Midtown, Soho, or Tribeca, but who currently have no permanent residence and no meaningful supportive relationships. Teach us how to think and act strategically and creatively to break cycles of powerlessness, meaninglessness, and lovelessness. Help us to see the mentally ill as worthy of our respect and compassion instead of st stigmatization, marginalization, and incarceration. Open doors of opportunity to formerly incarcerated who have paid their debts, debts to society and who seek chances to be self-sufficient, assets to their families, and ongoing contributors to the quality of life in this haven on the Hudson. Oh God, bless our public servants in DOE, Health and Hospitals Corporation, the FDNY, the NYPD, Sanitation, ACS, the Building Department, the MTA, and the New York City Law Department. Please not only bless them, but also protect and provide for their families, friends, coworkers, and neighbors. Finally, we pray for our mayor, his cabinet, and his appointees as city commissioners. Give them the dynamism, courage, and vision to chart a course in the future that benefits not only the same faithful few, but will be a blessing to all who call New York home. Help these, your people, remember that you have permitted them to rise to great heights, that they may see and follow the light which promises a better tomorrow if we plan together, pray together, work and walk together today. May we practice humility and hope, which reminds us we are all made up of sacred dirt and made for shared destiny. This is our prayer. We ask it in the names by which we have learned to call you. I ask it in the name by which I am saved, the name who is the source of my strength, the name in which I experience and express love, the name which enables and encourages me to be my best self, not my worst self, the name in which I still find hope in the midst of a world characterized by chaos, confusion, and conflict. In Jesus' name, I ask it all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. I'm going to now ask Councilmember Crystal Hudson to spread the invocation on the record. Thank you, Majority Leader Powers. I'm honored that Reverend Anthony L. Trufant is in the council chambers today. I now make a motion for unanimous consent to spread the invocation in full upon the record. For decades, Reverend Trufant has been a cornerstone. Shh. For decades, Reverend Trufant has been a cornerstone of the Clinton Hill community, providing spiritual guidance to thousands and supporting the hardworking folks of my district. Since November 1990, Reverend Trufant has served as the senior pastor of the 4,000-member Emanuel Baptist Church of Brooklyn. He has partnered with church leaders and members to empower congregants so they can on not only enjoy their lives, but also make an impact on their world, locally, nationally, and globally. In just a few decades, Reverend Trufant has cemented his place as a stalwart of spirituality, lecturing or speaking at everywhere from Cornell University to Princeton Theological Seminary to the University of Pennsylvania and establishing groundbreaking forums like the Rethink and Retool Conference, which helps urban pastors by providing them with the practical and conceptual resources needed to improve leadership at their churches. 
As an inimitable public speaker, experienced workshop facilitator, licensed conflict resolution mediator, and innovative pastor, Reverend Trufant continues to help Brooklynites fulfill their personal, spiritual, and professional dreams. And as a Spelman graduate, I'm always proud to uplift a Morehouse brother. I'm proud to call Reverend Trufant a friend, and I know his family, including his two young adult daughters, Sharice and Tony, and his wife, Muriel Good Trufant, are just as proud of him as I am. Thank you, Reverend Trufant, for all you've done for me and all you've done for my constituents and all you'll continue to do in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have the adoption of the minutes by Councilmember Linda Lee. I make a motion that the minutes of the charter meeting of January 4th, 2023 be adopted as printed. Thank you. We'll now go to messages and papers from the mayor. M113 through M119, various budget documents. Finance. M120, preliminary mayor's management report. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. M121, city debt and reserves. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. The communication from city, county, and borough offices. M's 122 and 123, budget modifications. Finance. Petitions and communications. M124, 2.75B, annual report. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. Land use call-ups. None. Thank you. We'll now have communication from Speaker Adrian Adams. Thank you, Majority Leader, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you and your families are safe, healthy, and well. I want to begin by acknowledging the loss of Eric Garvin, a former City Council staffer who worked in the Community Engagement Division under former Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito. Eric was a dedicated public servant who cared deeply about ending the scourge of gun violence. He was a beloved colleague and his work at the Council and later at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice focused on improving the lives of New Yorkers. Eric will always be a part of our Council family and his former colleagues at the Community Engagement Division are here today to honor his memory. His family is having a celebration of life service on February 10th at 11 a.m. at the Ebenezer AME Church in Fort Washington, Maryland, and the service will be live streamed as well. My thoughts and the thoughts of his council family are with his family and with his loved ones. As a city and country, we are all mourning the killing of Tyree Nichols by police officers in Memphis, Tennessee. Tyree was a loving father, an avid photographer and skateboarder and a valued member of his community. He should be alive today. And the police brutality that took his life demands accountability. Black people in this country as well as other communities have lost too many of our children, mothers, fathers and siblings to police violence and it must end. As a mother and grandmother, my heart aches for Tyree's mother and for his entire family as they continue to grieve his loss. Hearing his mother express how she felt when she, when she heard that her son called for her as he was being brutally murdered was more than heartbreaking. As we pursue accountability and change, it's important to prioritize measures that support the bereaved in their healing and recovery from the severe trauma that continues to impact our communities. As a city, we must focus on the necessary policy changes that we can enact to end all forms of abusive and discriminatory policing and police violence. Please join me in a moment of silence to remember the life of Tyree Nichols and of Eric Garvin. Thank you. I also want to take a moment to discuss the situation that unfolded in front of the Watson Hotel in Manhattan this week. This is a difficult issue. It's disappointing that the administration chose to handle the situation outside of the Watson Hotel in the manner it did, especially on a day when the governor proposed resources to support our city in helping asylum seekers and the neighborhoods welcoming them. From the beginning of the effort to move individuals to the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, there appeared to be inefficient communication and transparency. There were also indications that some individuals outside of the hotel who were not migrants did not 
help the overall situation, but may have played a role in undermining trust. I believe that some of this could have been averted with more openness about the cruise terminal, earlier engagement, access, and clear communication regarding the challenge the city was facing that precipitated a need to move people to accommodate families. That didn't happen, and unfortunately, we ended up in a standoff with a lack of trust on all sides. Rather than utilizing law enforcement to target asylum seekers who may have been uncertain and fearful, I would have preferred to see the administration engage credible voices outside of their own officials to play a constructive role. For those migrants who are working and had concerns about getting to their jobs in distant locations within a new city and those who were worried, there could have been space for more constructive conversations to address their concerns. It's unfortunate that didn't occur, and we must do better. We understand the challenges facing our city, and it's critical that those committed to being constructive participants be included as part of achieving solutions. We need to stop treating each other as enemies and disregarding the input of those acting in good faith because it is leaving everyone in our city who needs care left as collateral damage. My hope is we can start to address these issues far more collaboratively because so many of us are committed to doing the right thing for our people. We need earlier engagement and more collaborative efforts from the administration rather than an indifference of partnership with other officials and community members who are committed to being helpful. The reality is that our city faced a homelessness crisis well before we began welcoming people seeking asylum in our country here in our city. New asylum seekers only added to our high unhoused population, and the challenges we face as a city became even greater. The city hasn't focused enough on actions it can take on its own to reduce the population in our shelter system by removing the barriers to those transitioning into permanent housing, especially our longtime New Yorkers. While the administration's efforts to advocate for more resources and support from our federal and state government partners are critical, that cannot be to the exclusion of city-led policy changes. The city should eliminate the 90-day rule that delays those in our shelter system from receiving city FEPS rental vouchers. We must ensure the adequate funding and staffing of our social service agencies that helps end delays to supportive housing placements which can also help move people out of the shelter system. The administration can address the staffing issues and vacancies within its agencies that impede solutions to our homelessness crisis. There are steps the city can and must take to address the bureaucratic inefficiencies in our system serving people in our city's homeless and social service systems. It is unacceptable when half of food stamp recipi recipients cannot access federal benefits due to agency understaffing or that housing agencies are unable to advance affordable housing development. This has presented real consequences for New Yorkers and it cannot continue. This week, the council held a crucial joint oversight hearing by the committees on youth services, aging, and contracts on the issue of nonprofit contracting and our service providers being paid in a timely manner. I also had the opportunity to meet with some of our nonprofit sector leaders at a roundtable where we discussed concerns about workforce retention and inequitable wages, late payments, and bureaucratic hurdles facing nonprofits. Our nonprofit partners provide critical services that directly benefit the people of our city and we need to ensure that we support them and their workers to help meet the needs of all New Yorkers. I thank everyone who attended, participated in the hearing, and spoke up about the importance of our nonprofit sector. We are officially on the second day of Black History Month, which is also Groundhog Day, my baby's birthday, just saying. Happy birthday, baby, who's not such a baby anymore, but anyway. This month and, this month and every month, it is important that we reflect, recognize, and celebrate the vast contributions of black communities in our city and across the entire country. We can honor our ancestors and those who came before us, whose shoulders we stand on today by continuing the struggles for justice, liberation, and equality. 
As we celebrate Black History Month this year, let us remember how important it is for our children and generations after us to know the full breadth of our history and how rich it is. As we discuss black history, I want to highlight the recent birthdays of historic black leaders who spent their lives breaking barriers and fighting for our civil rights. January 31st was the birthday of Jackie Robinson, who broke barriers as Major League Baseball's first black player and served as a fierce and outspoken advocate. February 1st was the birth birthday of the great poet Langston Hughes, and February 4th marks the birthday of Rosa Parks, who would have been 100 years old. We honor her remarkable legacy and courage as a leader of the civil rights movement. And I also want to recognize during Black History Month, this is not scripted, that we must protect the history that is threatened to be taken away in different sectors of this great nation of ours. We must protect and never erase the history that is not just black history, but is American history. <laughs> February, colleagues, is also American Heart Month. And it's important to highlight that heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women in the country. Every year, one in four deaths is caused by heart disease, a staggering statistic that we must take steps to address. We're also wearing red ribbons today in honor of National Wear Red Day, which is observed on the first Friday in February to bring attention to women's heart health. Working together, we can take actions to promote greater heart health and work towards preventing cardiovascular diseases. There are some other notable days I'd like to acknowledge. February 1st is recognized as World Hijab Day, which honors the millions of Muslim women who choose to wear a hijab and fosters greater understanding and unity. February 1st is also National Girls and Women in Sports Day. It's been more than 50 years since Title IX was implemented. But as the first Women Majority City Council, we remain more committed than ever to the goal of equitable funding and access to sports for girls and women across New York City. And February 6th is Tubi Shivat, which marks the beginning of a new year for trees on the Jewish calendar. On this holiday, we recommit, we recommit to protecting and safeguarding our precious environment. Borough presidents are currently accepting applications for New Yorkers to serve on our community boards. And as the former chair of Queens Community Board 12, the second largest community board in the borough, I do understand the importance of civic engagement and participation on the neighborhood level. It's how I got my start in public service, and our community boards play a crucial role in upkeeping the health and well-being of our communities. I encourage all New Yorkers to apply to, for your local community board to help make your neighborhood a better place to live, work, and thrive. Before we conclude, I want to wish a very happy belated birthday to our colleague, Councilmember Ari Kagan, and a happy early birthday to Councilmember Shahana Hanif. I hope you enjoy celebrating with your family and loved ones. And finally, today, February 2nd, not just marks my daughter's birthday, but it also marks the 370th anniversary of the creation of the City Council. We're 370 years old. Come on now. According to our friends at the Bowling Green Association, on this day in 1653, New Amsterdam became the first place in America to create what was known then as the Common Council, which eventually became a predecessor to the New York City Council. Join me in celebrating the 370th anniversary of our great legislative body. Now let's move on to our stated agenda. First, first, we'll be voting on the following appointments. Stephen Chu as member of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Angie Master as a member of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Mark Ginsburg as a member of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. 
Carol R. N. Mead as a commissioner of the Board of Elections, Deanna Hoskins as a member of the Board of Corrections, Rachel Bettert as a member of the Board of Corrections. We will also be voting on the following finance items, a transparency resolution approving new designations and changes of certain organizations receiving funding in the expense budget. Next, we will be voting on the following land use items. 446 through 448 Park Avenue rezoning will facilitate the development of a six-story residential building with 11 housing units, including approximately three affordable under MIH. The council will be modifying under the MIH text amended, amendment to strike option two, leaving only option one as the requirement under MIH in council member wrestlers district. Reform Temple of Forest Hills rezoning will facilitate the mixed use redevelopment of the existing temple to increase its square footage Construct 153 housing units above, including, may we have quiet in the chambers, please? Thank you. To increase its square footage, construct 153 housing units above, including approximately 38 permanently affordable under MIH, 66 attended parking spaces on the cellar level, and 102 bike parking spaces. The community facility and house of worship will be fully ADA accessible, including flexible multi-purpose sanctuary space, classrooms, and offices on the ground floor. The council will be modifying the MIH text amendment to strike option two, leaving only option one as the requirement under MIH in council member Schulman's district. The annual report, pursuant to rule 2.75B in relation to complaints of sexual harassment as defined by the council's anti-discrimination and harassment policy will also be submitted. Next, we will be voting on the following pieces of legislation. First, we'll consider a pair of resolutions in support of establishing Lunar New Year as an official federal and city holiday. As we all know, Lunar New Year is one of the more important annual celebrations in many East and South Asian cultures. With more than 15% of the population in New York being of Asian descent, it only seems appropriate to have this annual holiday be observed as an official school holiday and an official holiday in the city of New York. Resolution 331A, sponsored by Councilmember Marte, calls for Lunar New Year to be recognized as an annual school holiday as a, and as an official holiday in New York City. Council, uh, resolution 421A, sponsored by Councilmember Sandra Ung, calls for Congress to pass and the President to sign H.R. 430, which establishes Lunar New Year as a federal holiday. Thank you to our staff member, Regina Paul. Next, introduction 421A, sponsored by Council Member Kevin Riley, will require the Department of Homeless Services to provide monthly reporting on the total number of families with children living in the shelter system, their average length of stay, how many families have transitioned to permanent housing, and data related to school enrollment and attendance for youth in shelters. Next, introdu introduction 92A, sponsored by Deputy Speaker Diana Ayala, calls for an advisory board to advise the mayor and the city council on accessibility issues regarding city shelters. The board would meet quarterly and include people living with a disability and who currently reside in or previously lived in a homeless shelter. The advisory board would provide an annual report on its review and recommendations, and we give our thanks to our staff, Aminta Kilowan and David Romero. Next, we will vote on a number of items designed to improve the accessibility of the city's housing stock to older adults and people with disabilities. Introduction 141A, sponsored by Deputy Speaker Ayala, would amend the New York City Building Code to require signage pointing users to the doors that are power operated or low energy power operated. Introdu introduction 375A, also sponsored by the Deputy Speaker, would require HPD to report on the number of affordable housing units marketed for people with disabilities that are actually rented to persons with disabilities. Introduction 676A, sponsored by Council Member Crystal Hudson, would mandate that new construction housing pro uh, projects receiving city financial assistance ensure all units adhere to universal design, a housing design approach that addresses barriers faced by individuals with disabilities, older adults, and youth with more robust accessibility features. We thank our staff, Audrey Sun and Taylor Zel Zeloni. This brings us to our pay equity package which will provide key data and analysis on inequity in our municipal workforce across race and gender, and enact practices that help promote workforce diversity and pay equity. First is Introduction 527A, sponsored by Council Member Carmen De La Rosa, which, will, which would require each city agency and department that requires job applicants to take a civil service exam to report on data related to those exams in order to evaluate and expand diverse recruitment and retention within city government. 
It would also require reporting on the agencies and departments training programs to evaluate recruitment efforts across government. The Department of Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS, would be tasked with coordinating the data collection and reporting to the Council. Next is Introduction 541A, sponsored by Councilmember Lewis, which would expand on the existing pay equity law, Local Law 18 of 2019, by requiring DCAS to collect and provide additional employment and pay data to the Council. It would capture more of the city workforce and provide year-round access to pay and employment data so the Council can provide more robust oversight at its direction. And finally, Introduction 515A, sponsored by yours truly, requires city agencies to conduct an analysis of compensation data and measures to address pay disparity in occupational segregation, diversity and inclusion training, and schedule and workplace accommodations. The head of each agency would be required to submit an annual report on staff retention, promotion, termination, and resignation with accompanying compensation information. Finally, this legislation requires DCAS to contract with a private sector expert to conduct a three-year pay equity analysis on a minimum number of civil service titles. The analysis would exam examine civil service titles within the largest gender and racial or ethnic demographic difference from the demographic found in New York City. We thank our staff, Allah Musawi, Jaisara Gan Ganapathy, Malcolm Butehorn, Nicholas Con Connell, and Rose Martinez. Thank you all for your attention, and I turn it back into the hands of our majority leader. Thank you, Speaker Adams. We're now going to move into discussions of general orders. Currently do not have anyone signed up. So we will move into the report of special committees. None. Report of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, Intro 515A, Agency Diversity Plans. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the C Committee on Civil Service and Labor, Intro 527A, City Recruitment and Retention. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 541A, Pay and Employment e Equity Data. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, Preconsidered Reso 472, Transparency Reso. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on General Welfare, Intro 92A, Shelter Accessibility Advisory Board. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 421A, Report on Families with Children. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, Intro 141A, Automatic Doors. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 375A, HPD Lotteries for Tenants with Disabilities. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 676A, Universal Design for Housing. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections M106 and Reso 489, approving the appointment of Stephen Chu, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Coupled on general orders. M107 and Reso 490, approving the appointment of Angie Master, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Coupled on general orders. M108 and Reso 491, approving the appointment of Mark Ginsburg, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Coupled on general orders. M109 and Reso 492, approving the appointment of Carol R. Edmead, Board of Elections. Coupled on general orders. M110 and Reso 493, approving the appointment of Deanna Hoskins, Board of Correction. Coupled on general orders. M111 and Reso 494, approving the appointment of Rachel Better, Board of Correction. Coupled on general orders. On the general orders calendar, LU 158 and Reso 495 and LU 159 and Reso 496, 446 through 448, Park Avenue rezoning. Coupled on general orders. LU 160 and Reso 491 and LU 161 and Reso 498, Reform Temple of Forest Hills rezoning. Coupled on general orders, and I now ask that the clerk take a roll call vote on all of the items coupled on today's general orders calendar. Excuse me. Abreu. Aye. Ariola. Ari on all, except for preconsidered Reso 472, for which I am a no. Thank you. Aviles. Aye on all. Ayala. Aye. Barron. I abstain from M106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, and the accompanying resolutions. And I vote no on LU 158, 159, and the accompanying resolution. And, and no on 160, 160. One, I do believe the MIA needs to be increased from 25% to 
to 60 percent so we can have real affordable housing and not have an MIH that has 25 percent and 75 percent market. And I on all the rest. Thank you. Botcher. Aye. Brennan. Aye. Brewer. I vote aye, and I look forward to working with those who are being appointed. I hope that they take their jobs very seriously and they hold their agencies accountable and uh, work for the people of the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you. Brooks Powers. Aye. Caban. Aye on all. Carr. No on pre-considered resolution 472, and I on the rest. Thank you. De La Rosa. Aye. Thank you. Dinowitz. Aye. Farias. I vote aye on all. Felice. Aye on all. Gennaro. Aye. Gutierrez. Aye on all. Hanif. Aye. Hanks. Aye on all. Thank you. Holden. Aye on all, with the exception of pre-considered Reso 472, of which I vote no. Thank you. Hudson. Aye on all. Joseph. Aye on all. Kagan. Permission to explain my vote? Go ahead. So I'm voting no on pre-considered resolution 472. I cannot support $125,000 from New York City taxpayers to vocal New York. And their representative was here right in this chamber and he spew hate toward Asian Americans. That organization never condemned his speech, never severe ties with this guy who is a convicted rapist. And I cannot uh, vote to support this group, especially using so much money from New York City taxpayers. And I'm uh, voting yes on everything else. Thank you. Krishnan. Aye on all. Lee. Sorry, aye on all. Lewis. I vote aye. Marte. Aye. Mealy. Menon. Aye on all. Moya. Aye on all. Thank you. Narcisse. Aye on all. Nurse. Aye on all. Ose. Aye on all. Paladino. I vote no on Reso 472 and aye on all the rest. Thank you. Wrestler. Uh, permission to explain my vote. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Majority Leader. So firstly, uh, I just want to commend the inspired appointments to the BOC uh, by the Speaker, Deanna Hoskins, and uh, Rachel Bedard. Dr. Bedard will bring much needed and rigorous oversight to the Department of Corrections, and they are great additions to the board. And I would like to speak in support of Vocal New York, uh, which is based in the 33rd Council District and does extraordinary work mobilizing directly impacted individuals, homeless individuals, formerly incarcerated individuals, people who use drugs, and ensure that their voices are at the center of the policy debates that we are having. This is an organization that I deeply respect and value and am proud to be allocating resources to support today and will continue to support for as long as I serve in the New York City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Richardson Jordan. Riley. Pre permission to explain my vote. Go ahead. Thank you, Majority Leader. I would just like to thank all my colleagues today for supporting me on intro 421, uh, which will quantify the number of families with children in shelters and their average length to stay. 
identify the individualized needs and eligible, eligibility for assistance, as well as monitor the children's enrollment and attendance records in schools. This is a very important legislation uh, that will help us accurately uh, get information about children and families within the shelter system. And I'm truly uh, excited that my colleagues are able uh, here today supporting this legislation, and I would like to vote aye on all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Rivera. I'm looking forward to working uh, with the appointees to the various uh, positions, including the Board of Correction, and I vote aye on all. Salamanca. Aye on all. Sanchez. Aye on all. Shulman. Aye on all. Stevens. Aye. Thank you. Ung. Aye on all. Velasquez. I'd like to disclose my brother is a board member of Samaritans and my husband is a uh, deputy commissioner of DAP. Aye on all. Vernikov. No one preconsidered Reso 472 and I on the rest. Thank you. Williams. I vote aye on all. Juan. Aye. Jaeger. Aye on all with the exception of Reso 472 on which I abstain. Thank you. Thank you. Borelli. I vote no on pre-considered uh, 472, I on all the rest, uh, and if I may add, we look pretty good, uh, for most of us at least, for being 378 <laughs> odd years old, so God bless. Powers. I vote aye, and I'd like to echo the minority leader sentiment. You all look very good from up here for 300 plus years. Speaker Adams. We all do look good for 370 years old, don't we? I vote aye on all. Council Member Hanif. I'd like to disclose on the record that my fiance is affiliated with an organization we fund, the New York Immigration Coalition. Uh. I would normally gavel you guys be quiet, but I actually enjoyed that, so. <laughs> All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 49 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, which the, with the exception of land use items 158, nine, 159, 160, 161, and accompanying resolutions, which was adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative and one in the negative and zero abstentions and resolution 472 with a vote of 41 in favor, seven against and one abstention. And uh, items M106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111 and accompanying resolutions which had 48 in favor, zero against and one abstention. We will now move to the introduction and reading of bills. Yes. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you. We're now going to move into the discussion of today's resolutions. We will begin with Councilmember Ong, followed by Councilmember Marte. Good afternoon to my colleagues, and thank you to Speaker Adams and Majority Leader Powers for giving me the floor to urge my colleagues to support the resolution that we vote on later today. Resolution 424 expresses the New York City Council support for H.R. 430, a bill introduced by Congressmember Grace Meng in the House of Representatives to designate Lunar New Year as a federal holiday. In Asian society across the globe, Lunar New Year is the most important holiday in the calendar, including the Asian American community here in the United States and New York City, where we are the fastest growing ethnic group. 
Visiting Lunar New Year as a federal holiday would be important recognition of the contributions of the Asian Americans in this country, as well as a powerful sign of the awareness of our country's cultural diversity. One of the most significant ways we can acknowledge this positive contribution of the Asian American community and its importance to the history of this nation is by designating Lunar New Year as a federal holiday, and that's why it is important we as a city council express our support for HR 430. Here in the chamber, we have the most diverse group of city council members in this legislative body, but historic six AAPI members. The passage of this resolution shows lawmakers in Washington, D.C., in the largest city in the United States, as a broad support of making Lunar New Year a federal holiday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now call on Councilmember Marte. Thank you. I want to thank Speaker Adams for her support for this important piece of legislation. I also want to thank my staff, Ian Wang and Stephen Wong, and Regina Paul from Central Staff for making this resolution possible. I wanted to start out by wishing everyone a belated Happy Lunar New Year. Shi Nian Kwaila, Tu Nian Daji. I wish everyone a happy, healthy, and prosperous year of the rabbit. Lunar New Year is one of the most important annual celebrations for our Asian communities. In my district, which includes Chinatown, local Chinese community organizations host parades, lion dances, firework viewing, and treat fairs. For weeks, confetti lines every block, and you could buy oranges on every corner. The past few years have had much more muted celebration. The pandemic and the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes led families to stay inside. But this year, Chinatown came out in full force, providing the re proving the resiliency and strength of this immigrant community. Lunar New Year must be recognized as a city holiday. In addition, the DOE has not even allowed students to take the day off when the first day of the new year lands on a weekend. This caused a lot of confusions for students and kept them from celebrating with their family. I'm proud to pass this resolution today to honor the traditions of Asian American New Yorkers and to allow all of us to fully ring in the Lunar New Year. Thank you. Thank you. And now call on Councilmember Narcisse. Entry 912, a maximum support, requiring the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to prepare and submit a plan to improve nurse staffing level at hospitals. Councilmember, is this on one of today's resolutions? Friends, that's it for What's that? That's my intro that I'm pushing for. We're going to add you to the list for general oh. discussions on resolutions right now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Thanks. Anyone else like to speak on today's resolutions? Okay. We'll now have a voice vote on today's resolutions. If you wish to vote against or abstain from any of today's resolutions, please notify the Legislative Documents Unit by email or approaching the dais before the vote. I'll now read the resolutions into the record. Resolution 331A recognizes Lunar New Year as an annual school holiday and as an official holiday in the city of New York. Will all those in favor please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Resolution 424A calls the United States Congress to pass and the present to sign H.R. 430 establishing Lunar New Year as a federal holiday. All those in favor please say aye. All opposed say nay. Uh, any abstentions? Ayes have it. We'll now move into general discussion. We will start with Councilmember Palladino, followed by Councilmember Barron. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today I, thank you. Today I introduce uh, intro 913 to the council, which will amend the city charter and the administrative code of the city of New York del uh, by delaying implementation of local law 97 by seven years. Local law 97 as it currently exists would have drastic negative impacts on housing costs in our city. The steep fines associated with this law will be financially disastrous for already, already struggling middle class and working people. In fact, the potential to end middle class ownership of co-ops and condos in the city of New York in, in its entirety, while further increase, increasing rents across the board. I have solicited widespread community import, input and consulted with local stakeholders, including the Queen's President's Co-ops and Condo uh, President's Board. <laughs> with the looming impacts of Local Law 97. Their feedback was dire and unanimous. They cannot afford it. 
A delay of seven years would give building management and co-op boards the pro and property owners breathing room to adequate, adequately prepare and upgrade over a longer time frame in, in an affordable and thoughtful manner without fear of immediate and arbitrary ruinous penalties looming. It would also give our city and state time to further recover from the economic turmoil of the last few years and accomplish much needed work to upgrade our own electrical, electrical grid and energy production capacity in anticipation of this new demand. This is not a partisan issue. This is about giving our city a fair chance to reach the goals put forth by this war while doing so in recognition of our changed circumstances with the sensitivity to those who stand to be gravely harmed by it. I hope the council will, can come together and support my bill and delay the implementation for the sake of and the future of our economic well-being. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, council member. We're now calling council member Barron, followed by council member Brewer. Uh, thank you very much. My colleagues, I rise today to say that Black history is every day. We're not just the shortest and coldest month of the year, February, but it's every day. And black history is not just personalities. Black history is the ironing board. Black history is the traffic light. Black history is air conditioning. Thousands of convention, inventions that blacks never got credit for. Black history is every day. Black history is just not popular personalities you know. It's also Huey P. Newton and the Black Panther Party. It's also Asada Shakur, who's stuck in Cuba and needs to come home. It's Dr. John Henry Clark. It's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It's Marcus Garvey, who was the greatest nationalist and organizer ever that lived. The best way we can honor black history right now in this body <coughs> is to support an elected civilian review board and an independent prosecutor's office to prosecute police. I find it contradictory and interesting that Vice President Kamala Harris was at the funeral and said we need to immediately enact the legislation around George Floyd. But right here, this speaker won't even give us a hearing on an independent agency on an elected civilian complaint review board. Right now, we have a civilian complaint review board that the mayor picks the appointees, the city council picks, and after they finish the investigation, the police commissioner determines the punishment. Slap on the wrist. In the name of our brother Nichols, we should do this. Don't get up and talk all that stuff when you have an opportunity to do what the vice president said have something concrete connected to the demonstrations and the rhetoric. Pass it now. The speaker should at least give us a hearing. Thank you, Council Member. At least a hearing. Thank you. We'll go to Council Member Brewer, followed by Council Member Sanchez. Thank you very much. I first want to um, thank the speaker for mentioning the history of the City Council and to thank Arthur Piccolo from the Bowling Green Association who brought it to my attention. Um, I also want to thank Council Members Hanif and Ayala because we're all pushing for the ID NYC application process to be more uh, available and transparent to New Yorkers. Um, I get complaints, uh, it's a great idea, but sometimes hard to implement in terms of accessing the application and getting the ID. And then second, intro 910 with Council Member Hudson. Again, the same issue, trying to make sure that people can get the benefits that they are actually entitled to, particularly those who need public assistance. And to say that as we are uh, dealing with uh, people's uh, challenges in terms of poverty and need for food and shelter. It has to be, picking up on what the speaker said in her remarks today, has to be a government that is responsible to the people who need the help the most. And we keep forgetting that. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go to Council Member Sanchez, followed by Council Member Riley. Thank you, thank you, Majority Leader. Um, and I also want to thank the speaker for, for the mention. 370 years ago, they didn't think there would be women breast pumping in, uh, during council hearings. So, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is great, <laughs> which is what I'm doing. 
Um, colleagues, I want to draw your attention to intros 914, 915, and 917, a package of fair residential co-op disclosure bills that I'm introducing today alongside public advocate Jamani Williams. 914 would require co-ops to provide communication to board uh, of board decisions for sales of cooperative apartments. 915 would ensure boards provide written statements outlining the reasons for why a prospective purchaser was not chosen uh, to for the sale. And 917 would require cooperative corporations to provide financial information to prospective purchasers. A history of discriminatory practices, both overt and more insidious, have long served as barriers for home ownership for people of color in the United States and in our city. And with this package, we hope to take strides in increasing transparency in the Byzantine process of purchasing a co-op. Uh, boards and shareholders that, that are acting in good faith should have nothing to fear, but boards that, are, that have secretive practices that serve to perpetuate discrimination will need to revisit their, their own practices. So I'm, I'm proud of, of this uh, package, and I hope that my colleagues will join me. Thank you. And I'll hear from Councilman Riley, followed by Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Majority Leader. <clears throat> I'm happy to join my colleagues in government, Councilmember Borelli and Councilmember Ariola, to co-sponsor legislation that safeguards FDNY employees providing emergency medical services through protected body armor and comprehensive training. Intro 903 would seek to guard all EMS with suitable body armor that will prove most effective during extreme crisis. And importantly, Intro 904 focuses on vital training that equips these professionals on how to comprehensively de-escalate and resolve these crises to administer patient care. Uh, introducing legislation that provides new protective measures and training not only strengthens the department and the protection of its members, but it also improves the quality of service for patients and affected communities. Uh, thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you. We'll hear from Councilmember Shulman, followed by Councilmember Stevens. Thank you, Majority Leader. Today, I am proud to introduce Intro 918, which would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop and implement a citywide diabetes reduction plan for type 2 diabetes, the first really in the nation. And I want to thank the speaker and her staff and the committee staff for their support on this, because it's tremendous. Um, it's estimated that more than 37 million Americans have diabetes, and approximately 90 percent of those cases are type 2 diabetes. This plan is modeled off of the HIV, the United Nations HIV AIDS 90-90-90 plan, and it will empower the city to develop a plan, uh, strategies to reduce type 2 diabetes, including goals for a percentage by which the number of individuals with type 2 di diabetes in the city shall decrease in a time period in which the city plans to, to achieve such a decrease. With this legislation, New York City will lead the way towards reducing diabetes and ensuring New York is the healthiest city in the country. I urge my colleagues to sign on to this extremely important legislation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Stevens, followed by Councilmember Hanif. It is the reach of is the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my steps, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me, and every black woman. It is a pleasure to introduce the resolution 486 today. This resolution will recognize the accomplishments and issues faced by black women by designating February 15th annual, annually as Black Girl Magic Day in the city of New York. For too long, our stories have been overlooked, even when black women have exemplified the capacity of excellence in all facets of life, especially in spaces that we were never once to be imagined to be there. We have birthed nations. We've saved this country from itself time and time again. We have shared our magic and love with the world. And that is where the real magic resides, in our passion, in our poise, in our love, in our dedication, in our fuel, in our fire, in our presence every day. So all the past generations of black girls and women, thank you. For without you, we wouldn't be here. To my fellow black women, remember you are the definition of true strength and magic and will always forever be unmatched. I ask all my, my comrades and colleagues to sign on to Reso 486. And I would also like to send thoughts and prayers and family of the council member Diwell Four, who was shot and killed last night in New Jersey, another black woman. Thank you, council member. We'll now hear from council member Hanif, followed by council member Nurse. Thank you, Majority Leader. I'm excited to introduce intro 909 today with co-prime sponsors, Deputy Speaker Ayala and council member Brewer. IDNYC is a vital piece of identification for New Yorkers 
providing us with access to a wide range of benefits and services. It's a particularly critical resource for immigrant New Yorkers and asylum seekers who may have difficulty obtaining alternative ID. When I was a council staff for helping more constituents enroll in IDNYC was some of the work I was most proud of. However, despite its importance, many New Yorkers are still unable to obtain IDNYC due to an inefficient enrollment process. Currently, appointments need to be made far in advance on an online scheduler that is extremely difficult to use for even the most tech-savvy New Yorkers. Intro 909 addresses this issue by requiring DSS to offer same-day walk-in appointments for IDNYC. The bill also requires an on-site appeals process for applicants who are denied, regular training for staff to ensure they are up-to-date in any changes to documentation that is accepted as proof of identification, and regular assessments to determine the amount of appointments that need to be made available. This will make IDNYC much more accessible to our most vulnerable New Yorkers. I want to thank Brooklyn Defender Services, who use their first-hand experience with clients to help shape this bill, and I encourage my colleagues to sign on as a sponsor. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from Council Member Nurse, followed by Council Member Brooks Powers. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, colleagues. Today, I, along with advocates and many council members, launched a framework to abolish and rep replace the predatory tax lien sale. Thanks to years of hard work by our speaker and others, we know the complexities of abolishing this harmful practice, but we also know the opportunities. The tax lien sale is designed to target low-income, senior, black and brown homeowners. It was also designed to privatize an essential government responsibility, which is municipal debt collection. When we privatize essential government services, we abdicate responsibility and accountability, and the city gives up all leverage to take a more active role in housing our neighbors. For the last year, many council offices have been meeting every two weeks with advocates to devise an alternative to the tax lien sale. This alternative would bring municipal debt collection back into the public realm, protect small homeowners from foreclosure, ensure small property owners can retain their equity, ensure tenants are not displaced due to neglectful landlords, and leverage the city's authority to crack down on speculation and create more affordable housing. I look forward to talking with you all more about this, and of course, if you have any questions, my door is always open. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll hear from Councilmember Brooks Powers, followed by Councilmember Frias. First, um, before the clock starts, I'd just like to acknowledge and disclose that I'm a member of the Greater al Nae Cathedral of New York, and we, are, we have voted on um, a transparency resolution that will move money for the organization. So, um, on the heels of our subway safety hearing back in December, I'm excited to be a co-prime sponsor, um, along with Councilmember Lewis, uh, on her resolution calling on the MTA to provide non-police staff in the subway with training and a protocol when encountering people experiencing mental health issues. We all know how important it is that we provide compassionate care to all New Yorkers and that ensuring our subways are safe means doing more than increasing police presence. The MTA should help ensure those who work in our subways have the tools to respond when they encounter someone in crisis. This is a benefit to those who need our help in the subways and also to the MTA's workers who do so much to ensure New York's transit system is healthy and functioning. So I thank Councilmember Lewis for advancing this legislation and I'm proud to co-sponsor it. I'm also proud to be on a co-sponsor on Reso 486, Black Girl Magic, um, in honor of Black History Month, recognizing the contributions of black women in this city. And last but certainly not least, I am extremely proud to be a co-prime sponsor along with my council member, Council Member Williams, on Reso 488 as a proud member of the illustrious Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, almost 18 years this year as a member. I'm so honored to be a part of this resolution, um, and, and this is historic for us. Thank you. Gonna have to separate you and the speaker, I think. Uh, I'm now will now hear from Councilmember Frias, followed by Councilmember De La Rosa. <laughs> Thank you, Majority Leader. I wanted to take the time to highlight uh, two co two street co-namings I'm introducing today. The first is for Glenn Mario Halsey Way, more popularly 
popularly known as DJ Mario. He was a beacon of light and joy in Soundview and frequently hosted blog parties across the street from Bronxdale Houses, which is recently named Sonia Sotomayor Houses. He was a pillar of the emerging hip hop community because of the mentorship he gave to up and coming musicians to help them make a name for themselves. DJ Jazzy J had his first appearances with Mario and artists like Grandmaster Kaz referenced Mario in their music. The history of hip hop is often not written in history books. While we all know that this industry changing genre emerged from the Bronx in the 1970s, the names of those who helped create and foster it are often left unsaid and without the recognition they deserve. In honor of Black History Month, I'm proud to introduce a co-naming that emphasizes black excellence. DJ Mario was a trailblazer, a visionary, a man who invested in his community. I cannot wait to see his name above Rosedale and Watson Avenue. The second co-naming I'm proud to introduce today is for Shahan Agruda Way. He was the owner of a local gas station in Castle Hill and an inspiration to the community. His shop was once penned as an oasis in the Bronx because of his warm hearted and kind spirit. Shahan's small business is a longtime staple in my Castle Hill community. His place um, and, and himself really have looked out for all of us, including when my mom was a young single mom with her first car. He was her first mechanic and is still my mechanic um, and, and many others in the community. Um, and so I'm really excited to be bringing this back into to our home. Shahan and DJ Mario's life and legacy is exactly what the Bronx is about, and I look forward to seeing those Green Streets signs up to honor both of their legacies. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to Councilor De La Rosa, followed by Councilor Renorsis. Thank you so much. I want to join Speaker Adams in a, a moment of reflection for Tyree Nichols. A system that is built on oppression and racism took Tyree's life. We cannot reform hatred. We must cut it out at its root. De-institutionalize de 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 it and decommission it. It is dehumanizing and devastating to live in a world where the callous murder of black men in America by police is seemingly becoming the norm. We can no longer turn a, black, a blind eye to this broken system. My heart and prayers are with the Nichols family and their loved ones. This is a pain no family should ever have to endure. As mothers, we are not built to bury our children. My deepest condolences is with them in these moments. In 2011, we lost another dear New Yorker to the blight that is police brutality. Today, we are introducing a co-naming in his honor so that we may remember that this should have never happened and should never happen again. John Collado was my neighbor, a friend to the community, a husband who tried to do the right thing. In his attempt to settle a dispute, a plainclothes detective took his life down the street where I grew up. The use of excessive force is a necessary practice that should never have become what feels like the standard practice today. I look forward to working with my colleagues as we seek solutions within the power we hold as elected officials to hold abusive police officers accountable and eradicate brutality in our city. Thank you. Thank you. And I go to Councilman Narcisse, followed by Councilman Kagan, followed by Councilman Relay. <clears throat> Entra 912, that's what I'm asking for support, requiring the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to prepare and submit a plan to improve nurse staffing levels at hospitals. There is a clear um, connection between nurses' staffing ratios and the quality of care that patients receive. A growing body of evidence has shown that the rate of mortality in acute care setting decreases with a higher rate of the number of registered nurses to patients. One nurse can only do so much. I have been a nurse for over three decades, working in the ER in uh, acute care. Inadequate and poorly um, monitored nurse staffing practices jeopardize the delivery of quality healthcare services and adversely impact the health of the patient who enter, who enter the hospitals possibly resulting in dangerous medical errors and patient infection or worse. But I'm not scaring you, you still can go to the hospital. Further, the rate of injury and infection decre um, decreases with, increases, um, with increased nurse staff. 
Research shown that appropriate nursing intervention can reduce the length of stay in acute care setting and improve the quality of life in long-term care settings. I hope you will join me supporting Intro 912 as we take a big step towards improving the quality of healthcare for all New Yorkers. And I have to remind you, health is wealth. So let's practice it by improving in ratio of the nurses staff. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Kagan and lastly, Councilmember Lee. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who, uh, who sent me best wishes on my birthday. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I also would like to say that I proudly voted today on two resolutions related to Lunar New Year, and I would like to encourage all of my colleagues to co-sponsor and to help uh, for support on bringing uh, legislation intro 622, no meter parking during the Lunar New Year, to the floor of New York City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to hear from Councilmember Lee and then Councilmember Lewis. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Speaker, Majority Leader, and my fellow Council members. Today I'm proud to introduce Reso 483 alongside Public Advocate Jumani Williams and Education Chair Rita Joseph in support of state legislation from Senator Leroy Comrie that would require high schools to make financial literacy classes a graduation requirement for all students. Pre-pandemic surveys showed that approximately 41% of New Yorkers did not have savings to cover three months of expenses in case of an emergency, and that 11.5% of our older adults live in poverty compared to 9.7% nationally. Much of this reflects how New Yorkers are not, not being taught the basics of financial literacy in school. Too many of our students, particularly those who come from low-income households, graduate without skills and the know-how to make long-term decisions about student loans, budgeting, and debt management. Our city currently teaches about economics and free enterprise, but none of these courses provide students with the more practical basics of responsible personal, personal finance. This resolution is in pursuit of a vision where every student, regardless of socioeconomic background, is equipped to make informed financial decisions and improve their quality of life. So I hope you will all join me. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, Majority Leader and Speaker. Good afternoon, colleagues. Today I would like to encourage my colleagues to support Resolution 3148, calling on the MTA to provide non-police staff working the subway system with training and protocol for handling issues with mental, mentally ill customers. The COVID-19 pandemic is winding down, but it has left us with a catastrophic mental health crisis within our city. We see this and feel it every day, particularly on our subways. Everyone deserves to feel safe on the subway and in New York City more broadly. In recent years, we have, we have seen high profile episodes where people have either been pushed, slashed, or jumped to their deaths on subway tracks. Deploying police officers to patrol the subways and address people with mental, mental illness is not the best use of resources, nor is it the best way to keep people safe. Various aspects of police response, including uniforms, handcuffs, and or sirens, can exacerbate a mental health episode. This is counterproductive in accomplishing the goal of keeping people who use the subway safe and healthy. This resolution calls on the MTA to replace some police officers with non-police who are trained in responding to mental health episodes and have clear protocols to follow. This will allow for the de-escalation of mental health crises, as well as greater transparency and clarity for everyone involved. More importantly, we'll get police officers out of the business of responding to mental health crises so they can use their time, taxpayer money, more effectively. By passing this resolution, we send a clear message to Albany and to our constituents that we are serious about their well-being and safety for all New Yorkers. I encourage my colleagues to sign on. Thank you to Council Member Brooks Powers for supporting this bill. Thank you. Do we have anyone else signed up to speak? Okay, with that, I'll now call on Speaker Adrian Adams to close out today's state meeting. Thank you, Majority Leader. The stated meeting of February 2nd, 2023 is hereby adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>